Welcome to another episode on the Close.io Women in Sales series. In this episode, I'm speaking with a guest that I've known for quite some time. She has been a corporate M&A lawyer for many years on Bay Street. She's a been a partner at firms and when I first met her she was a partner at one of the law firms that had sponsored an initiative that I was in charge of at a Canadian student nonprofit. I wanted to interview her to learn about her story and how she has been able to manage high stakes high stress situations in the past and now founding a company for the space that she has practiced in for so many years. She's also had a long-running, amazing dynamic with her co-founder. They actually go way back at a law firm that they used to work at, and she ultimately leaves us with how much fun it's been for her to start a company and how much support there's been. So I hope you enjoy. Here we go. Hi, everyone. This is Rebecca at Close.io bringing you our interview series featuring women in sales, where we find out how they grow and thrive both personally and professionally. In this episode, I'm speaking with Rebecca Cassaba. Hey, Rebecca. (laughs) Hey, Rebecca. (laughs) Hi, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Dealmaker, which is a software for closing financing transactions. Amazing. Previously, Rebecca was a partner at Denton's LLP and Aired and Burlesque LLP. She was also a second D at the Ontario Securities Commission. Rebecca earned her LLB at the University of Windsor and a bachelor's in psychology at Western University, which I also attended. (laughs) So that's another common trait. Go Western. Why did you choose to study psychology and why did you pursue a degree and a career in law? Well, thanks, Rebecca. So my older sister did psychology and then law as well. So I guess you could say I followed in her footsteps. Both my sisters are lawyers and my father is a lawyer. So it sort of runs in our family. Uh, My grandparents immigrated from the Ukraine on both sides during just after World War II, during times of extreme poverty. So um, my parents, you know, it was important to them to instill in us a skill set that was always something that we could rely on ourselves to make an income. Amazing. And um, what do you think you learned the most from your experience at law school um, about yourself, life, uh, soul searching? (laughs) Honestly, I think the thing that I learned the most was that I hate law school. (laughs) Really? Yeah. um, You know, I have a lot of good things to say about it. Like first year, you're learning an entirely new language and way of thinking, which is really, really useful. And it gives you an overall appreciation for the way our societies themselves are structured and how they operate. And then in second and third year, you're kind of applying that knowledge and understanding in more specific case type scenarios. Um, But I say that I, I learned that I hated school because for me, I'm much better in practical application of things in real life scenarios. I just enjoy interacting with people and helping people solve their problems. Um, So I found when there are real life transactions and real money on the line, I'm just much more engaged. Where do you think that um, analytical, critical thinking side of you came from? Was that, was that something that you had in you and knew like when you were a little girl, like, do you think that you would have gravitated toward that even without the the family traits? (laughs) Um, Maybe not law specifically. I, I always wanted to go into business. And so um, yeah, I'm really happy to finally have found, made my way to Dealmaker um, in the startup culture. It's been great. It's got a lot of energy and it's a lot of fun. So tell us about your journey in founding uh, your company and the fact that you and your co-founder go way back. Um, you guys are kind of like a dynamic duo having headed up the startup business unit at Aird and Burles. And now you're the dynamic duo co-founders of Dealmaker. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's true. Um, I guess, you know, I can say a lot of the classic things, you know, we have similar work ethics, we both have strong family values, and good communication. But I think ultimately, you know, it was clear for us in the early days when we we started co founding the group at Aird and Burles that whatever we worked on together was vastly improved when we both contributed and became much better than what one person could do alone. And so I think if you look for that and always choose to surround yourself with people that you think are smarter than you, you will always continue to improve. What do you think makes your um, working relationship work so well? Um, What do you think 
you guys use as frameworks or um, just useful framing in general for unpacking and just making decisions? I think that's sort of evolved over time. We were pretty good at setting um, regular meeting schedules and then uh, really using those meetings to flush out ideas, but then drive them to key takeaway action items. That's something I think that's always important in startup culture, but really true in any business. It's fine to talk about things, but really at the end of the day, even you know the adage move fast and, and break things means that for every meeting you have, you have to walk away with everyone having their to-dos to drive that deadline forward. Yeah. And during your time in starting up the business unit, I'm sure there were a lot of uh, interesting startups and founders like coming into your offices and you uh, more than giving legal advice, kind of giving them some business direction as well. Um, what was that experience like? That was so much fun. I mean, it was it was a great experience for us to get to work with so many really smart and intelligent founders and to talk to them about their business models and learn them and understand them and whether they were doing, you know, acquisition roll-up strategies or product development, just seeing their different leadership styles and their approaches to problems really gave us such a great perspective on how we wanted to run our own company. How do you think your um, experience having gone through law school, having practiced for a significant amount of time influenced your uh, advice in giving, in giving founders the direction that they needed? I think, you know, you know, in thinking about where my sort of sales adage developed from, my father was very entrepreneurial while he was running his law practice. He also started a winery and I had some experience there um, in the summertime helping him set up his shop figuring out what point of sale system to use, selling in the store, and most importantly, I think doing cold calling. I think cold calling is really the best way to learn sales. And when I'm hiring, I always pay close attention to anyone who's had that experience because I know it sounds old fashioned, but it really helps build character. And you really figure out your own sales strategy in that you have to come up with your own tricks to get yourself in the door and to get people to return your calls and to invite you back for a second meeting. When I was doing it with wine, I think that was a great environment to learn it in because handing out alcohol, it definitely <laughs> is, makes cold calling easier. And people know you have some free alcohol to give them. Um, but in law sales, is really the same thing, uh, except that you, it's a little more personal because you're actually trying to sell yourself. You have a firm brand right. behind you, but you're really selling yourself as a person individually in your own skill set. Yeah. And by the way, that's amazing that dad had a side hustle <laughs> while <laughs> running. Is, oh, that is like OG entrepreneurship. Definitely. Always having a side hustle. And I didn't know that you did cold calling as well, but that makes sense. Cause when I was first introduced to you, I was told like Rebecca has a killer sales acumen and <laughs> I'm, I'm so happy to hear that you honor that. Cause we at Close.io totally believe in picking up the phone and calling your customers, talking to people, getting those real conversations. And we, um, just, you know, but we believe in salespeople in that way that, um, those authentic conversations are what drive meaning and value forward. Definitely. So when, when we started building the startups practice group, um, that was one of the, you know, we basically took a business approach to it, which um, is a, somewhat unusual in the practice of law. Like we focused on, okay, this is our customer. We're going to understand them. We're going to use our blog to give them tools that we think would be helpful for them so we can show them that we understand their needs. And then we're going to use this to build a brand and build a pipeline and a funnel and funnel leads through it. Um, and we're gonna leverage different people throughout the pieces of the process so that we can convert those leads, leads and streamline on execution. But that was, as I said, an unusual thing to do in law, uh, probably partially because it involves a lot of cold selling, which a lot of people aren't comfortable doing, but to us it was just like, well, we're just gonna go out and try it. And you just keep knocking on doors. Yeah. And you guys were very innovative and forward thinking in that sense. And whenever people uh, interacted with you, it seemed like they were able to tell quickly that you guys get it. 
Thank you. Yeah, I hope so. Because we had done it, you know, Matt, Matt had done a startup before. And so I had had, you know, the various experience that my father imposed on me from a young age. So uh, we knew what people were going through and ultimately happy to be here and doing my own startup. Yeah. Content marketing is so big right now. And like my local grocery store has their own podcast, um, you know, and in terms of building out their business, but at the time, what gave you guys the idea to start a blog and start blogging about different topics? And like, that was back then, it wasn't something that was common. It was kind of like, like you say, like out of the ordinary. Yeah. And you know, it's going to sound funny, but like, I, I am quite interested in sort of uh, what's going on in, in just culturally and on, I'm, you know, on Instagram, I'm on Twitter, I'm on all these things. And it was very clear to me how brands were using those tools. And so they're free and I didn't have a lot of budget to start mm -hmm. to begin with. So it was just very clear to me that those tools should be applicable for law as well. Likewise, we're using them for DealMaker, even though it's an enterprise software and it's B2B. Um, I think, you know, our opportunities to market as a small business online and where the tools are free is just so incredible in 2018 that um, we really have to take advantage of that because it allows us to compete with bigger enterprises on such a smaller budget. Mm, that's a smart move in terms of allocating where you, where you are allocating your marketing dollars. Mm -hmm. What um, can you tell us about deal maker right now as a business what are you guys going through i know there's been a few team members added uh lately um and somebody that uh that we both personally know who is a student and has a programming background so i sent some uh, exciting things bubbling up yes definitely and he's doing a great job he's been doing everything extremely helpful we just did the website redesign we're doing a bunch of new product features uh, we just went through a big round of hiring uh, and we followed the methodology in the book, The Who, which one of our investors recommended to us, which I can't say enough good things about. Um, it just really helped us hone our hiring strategy and we ended up with some phenomenal talent I'm so happy about. And so that was, uh, that was a lot of fun. And then we're working on our pipeline for DealMaker now and developing our content marketing for the newsletter and building up our presence in different ways um, through Twitter and LinkedIn and different um, you know, profile magazine applications and things like that. So obviously, and I may be a bit biased, but I think if anybody or any two people should be t tackling this problem and building out software in this space, it should be you and Matt. Um, but were there, were there moments where, um, you know, approaching an industry like law felt daunting, even though you guys have been in it, you know, but did it felt, feel daunting? And was there a significant time between kind of coming up with the idea and you guys vetting it out to being like, okay, we're going to both focus on this. We're going to do it full time. Definitely. There's definitely different points. I mean, we've been working on it now. We just did our seed raise, but we've been working on it now in ideation and, and different forms of MB, MVPs for a couple of years. Uh, so there was a lot of daunting points along the way, but having a co-founder to push it through yeah. when you just can't figure out what to do next is always really helpful. So, so that you know has, has been very fortunate that way and what's gotten us to where we are now for sure. But I think one thing we always say to each other is there's a lot of, um, what's the most daunting is when you're in indecision and you're trying to evaluate different possibilities. Am I going to make the leap and I'm going to go full time? I'm going to leave the legal practice. Like evaluating those possibilities is what's daunting. Right. Once you make a decision and you just go for it, everything becomes a lot easier. Yeah. And I can imagine you are accustomed to high stakes, high stress. I mean, what would you say is more stressful, practicing law or <laughs> starting a company? <laughs> Now that you've done it both. Yeah, yeah, no, well, I think, I think doing M&A is pretty stressful, especially when you have a lot of deals on the go. Um, it's definitely been a lot of fun leading up to being able to get DealMaker financed and off the ground. So I'm, I'm just having a great time. It's definitely got its different stresses, but, um, you know, it's, it's the company that we, it's our ideas, our products. So, so it's very gratifying as well. 
Yeah. And when I first met you, I remember you were pregnant. So ladies out there, you can truly have it all. You can, <laughs> you can start a family, you can be closing M&A deals and you can start a company and you're still so young. Like that is badass. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I think that's really important to mention. My daughters, Sophie and Daphne, are three and two. I spent the last two years building up the company as well as being a partner on Bay Street. So there's a ton of different stuff you can do. You just have to be prioritized and organized and go for what you want to do. Yeah. What are some of the things that you've learned along the way about juggling all these different aspects of life and making it work? Uh, I think it's just like really applying the agile method to everything. You just prioritize what's important to you and, and, you know, making sure, you know, that my kids got to their doctor's appointment or whatever it was that day. Um, and everything else, just don't worry about it. It, it falls away in the background. So you've spent, um, almost your entire career in this industry that you're building software for. Um, what is that like and what advice do you have for people that want to build software to do something better and they want to push forward like, better workflows, better solutions in their space? And, you know, they're doing it um, out of love, but there's obviously some challenges that things, even when you know a space so well, there are still things that you don't know and have to figure out along the way. Yeah, there was definitely different things I, I have learned about my space that I didn't realize because when you get, when you're doing one job, you get into a silo about it. And so seeing the space from a different angle, viewing different law firms, talking to so many other lawyers, seeing how they practice has been incredible for me to see the practice from all different sides, even doing my own financing round from a business perspective, rather than, you know, closing other people's financing round, I learned so much. So I think, you know, women are naturally pretty good at just like taking in all the advice and learning. And, uh, you know, Matt and I always try to learn from each other, admit when we're wrong and just keep moving forward. Um, the important thing, you know, there's always setbacks in everything for sure. Just, I expect that. And the important thing is just moving through them and learning what you can from them and just getting, getting over the, them, that hump and moving on to the next thing. Can you give us a timeline of when um, you guys had started to work on uh, Jailmaker full-time? Like how long ago was that? Uh, pr uh, probably five months ago for me. Okay. So that's fresh. And do you have any advice for founders out there on raising seed funding? <laughs> uh, just talk to build your lead pipeline. So build your list of people that whose door you want to knock on and then go out to all those people. Don't wait for people to get back to you. Just keep reaching out to more people. Um, because if you, if you create like a, a domino effect where you're waiting for someone to get back to you before you go to the next person, it'll take much longer to complete. So don't wait for people to come back to you, just go out to everyone you can and keep selling, selling, selling. And the people who want in are the people who are gonna get in first. And those are the people that are gonna be the best advisors for you and are gonna help you the most. So if you build a huge pipeline, then um, you're gonna get them, you're gonna maximize your ROI from it. Yeah, that's a great point is just to keep pushing and put out consistency and don't get too hung up along the way, just keep it, keep it moving along. <laughs> Yeah, because there's a, there's a big difference between someone saying, I'm going to invest 100 grand and then actually writing a check for 100 grand. So don't, when someone says they're going to write you a check, that doesn't actually mean they're going to write you a check. Mm. So keep selling, <laughs> keep pushing them, keep bringing in other people because you actually may have a lot more sales to do between the verbal confirmation and actually getting the money in the bank. Yeah. And I, that's what I love about you, Matt. You guys are like true and true hustlers. I mean, it totally comes for you. I, to, I can totally see it coming from like your dad and your family and all that. But when I, when he first, when we had coffee about um, him telling me about Dealmaker, which it, I, obviously the name wasn't told to me at that time, but it was like this idea. I was like, dude, like, do you guys not have enough going for you? Like, you're <laughs> yeah. crushing it in your careers already. And like, you want to do even more. And he's just like, yeah, you know, well, we think that we could really help. We could really add value. And I'm like, this is just amazing. Like <laughs> I, I kept, I kept saying how excited I was for you guys. 
Well, it's been, it's really nice to hear that, you know, you've, you've known us a long time. So you've watched us through the course of the process as it developed from just being right. an idea and something we were talking about until actually becoming a full fledged funded company. Yeah. And what I will say is that, um, you know, authenticity is a buzzword, you know, these days, but you know, everybody around you and Matt loves you guys because you guys are genuine. And that's why I like enjoy talking to you guys as, as people, not just as founders, as lawyers. It's like, like I say, you guys get it. And I think that's what makes you guys, um, always so people are so drawn to your vibe, um, and, and like value your intensity and your hustle because they get it just like you get it. <laughs> well, thanks so much. I think that's probably ultimately why it was better for me to get into a different business because, you know, as lawyers, we were trying to drive our margins down to, you know, make things more affordable for entrepreneurs. And that's, um, that's the best client service, but you know, that's not the most profitable thing to do as a lawyer probably. So, uh, better that we go into business and, and try to do something a different way. Yeah. Can you speak to a little bit of what you're thinking in terms of your, um, sales strategies going forward? I mean, obviously you guys have an amazing network, um, coming from your careers. So I, I, I assume, or I deduce that that's going to be, um, a part of that, but how do you kind of, um, or give us advice on, uh, reaching out to people in that way and getting their support for now, um, not necessarily working on deals with you, but supporting your product, giving you guys feedback, pointing you in the right direction and ultimately building a business. Yeah. So we, um, we have a lot, as you mentioned, we have a lot of contacts in Toronto and New York. So we're going to leverage off those as first priority. And then, you know, we have some conversations about working with resellers or build, you know, maybe we do a larger financing round and build up our own sales force. Those are both options as well. Um, so right now we're definitely looking at all those in the future and evaluating. We'll just see how things roll out right now. We're in a fortunate position where we have more users than we can handle. So we're just racing to get, you know, the team up to scratch and the technology up to scratch so that we can fill the orders that we have. So we're really in a fortunate position right now, but I, uh, we're, we're thinking about all those options and laying the groundwork so that we can scale things up very quickly and, and that may involve working with um, one of our more established, like a partnership arrangement um, with Diane Durham potentially or someone else who can help us with rolling the product out faster. Can you give us advice on how you handle stress or maybe you don't get stressed anymore? Because I think you have like an iron backbone from <laughs> you handle, but um, you know, just in moments of times where you might be a little bit stressed because naturally there is a certain level of emotional resilience and regulation that comes with being an entrepreneur. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I think I've probably developed some, some pretty good coping mechanisms working in M&A over the last decade. <laughs> so um, it's kind of hard for me to remember now, but I think, you know, having my kids and coming home and seeing their adorable faces is a real de-stressor. De Working out helps. Um, and I've, I've really learned to identify internally when I can tell that my blood pressure is rising. I can tell that I get short with people and I try to actively combat that because um, when you're stressed, especially at M&A, like you're stressed all the time, uh, I really try to work to... Um, just internally regulate it so that I'm not being a jerk to everyone around me. Yeah. And also it's tough because you're ultimately in a client facing position. So you, it's not like you can just lock yourself in a room and kind of like stress it out and kind of just like pump out what you need to do. You'll still need to be talking not only to your colleagues who may be very understanding because they might be equally as stressed, but you still have to go and update your client and kind of manage that relationship as well. So I think yeah. that requires a huge amount of self-awareness. Yes, exactly. And that's true. And one of the things I was taught early on is to, when there's an issue, because there's always going to be an issue, things come up uh, when you're doing deals, is you, you have to go to the client, you have to go to someone and present the issue and then present your potential solutions. So that always drives you to next steps. And rather than sitting in a stressful state, 
you just evaluate the issue that's causing the stress and then come up with solutions. They may not be the best solutions, but that forces you to have a conversation that leads to the solution. So you move through whatever's causing the stress. Being solutions oriented is, yeah. I mean, basically your, your job, but also a very <laughs> important coping mechanism. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Amazing. Well, is there anything that I haven't asked you or that we haven't discussed yet that you'd like to leave our audience with? Um, just that, you know, I think founding a business is a lot of fun and I encourage all the women out there to do it and to help each other do it. There's a lot of really great support systems out there. I've gotten so much support from my, all my investors and my advisors and my mentors, 99% of whom are men. So, um, there's a ton of great support out there. So give it a shot. Yes. And where can people find you and find out about the company, connect with you, learn more? Dealmaker.tech or find me on LinkedIn or shoot me an email, Rebecca at Dealmaker.tech. Thank you so much for being on the Close.io Women in Sales podcast. Thanks, Rebecca. Hey, did you enjoy this episode? I'd love to hear your thoughts and suggestions. If you have questions that you'd like our guests to answer, or if you know of a woman in sales that we should feature, email me, Rebecca at close.io. That's with one B and two C's. And if you enjoyed this episode, got value out of it, got inspired, share it with a friend. There's a link in the description where you can also find show notes and you can follow this series by subscribing to close.io's YouTube channel, iTunes, SoundCloud, and various other podcast apps that you might already use. See you guys on the next one.